Hello, uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's research exchange. My name is Yvette Sibramani and I work here at Citrus. And we are pleased that we have Prof Professor Carlos Malzahn here to talk about his work on scientific data and storage systems. A few quick announcements. Um, first, welcome to the web viewers. As you know, Citrus is four campus, and so the people at the other four, three campuses get together at UC Merced, UC Davis, and Santa Cruz to watch these talks as well. Uh, on Friday, we have an Eye for Energy talk in this room at 1 p.m. on vibration energy harvesting for wireless sensor networks. And next Tuesday, there's an interesting talk on anthropology as big data. It's Tuesday at noon, and it's over in the Berkeley Center for New Media Commons, which is over by um, Moffitt Library. So if you're interested in that, there are flyers in the back. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Carlos Malzahn today. He is the director of the UC Santa Cruz Systems Research Laboratory and the co-founder and associate director of the UCSC Los Alamos Institute for Scalable Scientific Data Management. His research is in the area of computer systems, and he specializes in scalable file system data and metadata management and storage performance, man man performance management. So please join me in welcoming Professor Valtzahn. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, those are a lot of words with, you know, that are mouthful. But um, uh, I'm a storage person, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, coalescing scientific data management with storage systems. Sorry, the abstract didn't quite make it to the announcement, um, but this is mostly a problem uh, that we're facing in supercomputing as well as cloud computing, um, and some of these problems that, we, that we're facing that I will talk about. I hope this works, yep. So, um, so let me just give you an executive uh, summary and then uh, you can decide whether you want to pay attention to this talk or not. Uh, so uh, this is a, uh, the BGP IBM Blue Gene uh, uh, supercomputer at Argonne National Labs. Um, it has a whole bunch of compute nodes um, and it has a file server and enterprise storage. Um, and uh, some of these uh, I.O. nodes are forwarding data that uh, these simulations that run on these big computers uh, need, to, um, as, need to take checkpoints and these checkpoints are basically there to uh, be able to restart the simulation. Um, uh, just uh, a recap from Hank Charles' uh, talk, and he's uh, here, I'm really glad about that, um, and I really recommend that you see this talk if you haven't so. Um, uh, so the Department of Energy is uh, tasked to build an exascale computer by 2018, although that 2018 has now um, <laughs> Uh, is, is now a name. It might be 220 or t uh, 2020 or 2022. Uh, anyway, so the problem there is that if you look at these estimates and how, what the system is going to look like, it's exascale computer and 10 to the power of 18 flops. Um, that um, if you look at today's systems, they can do about two petaflops uh, per second. I think this is the uh, uh, machine at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, Jaguar. Um, and the, uh, when you look at what it's supposed to do, one exaflop, that's a factor change of 500, or almost three orders of magnitude. Uh, when you look at the power consumption, uh, it's supposed to do this in t with 20 to 40 megawatts, which is only a power factor of like one order of magnitude. So power is going to be a huge issue. Um, uh, that drives other things as well, like for instance, the uh, uh, memory is one of the major uh, uh, power consumers. And so we are uh, you know, supposed to have only two orders of magnitude change in memory, while we have uh, uh, a, you know, three to four orders of magnitude changes in cores. Um, so this is a highly parallel machine, highly power constrained and highly memory constrained. And we need to somehow learn how to uh, program this machine, and we have this problem that um, uh, if you look at scientific data management, it's mostly um, uh, limited to uh, these I/O nodes. And I will uh, define what scientific data management is in more detail. And storage is kind of separate uh, in the right end, if my clicker works. And so the problem is that a lot of the communication, the data movement that we have is actually also a huge power consumer. Um, so the power challenge is, uh, aside from CPUs, 
uh, memory, network, and storage. And so the approach uh, that we are looking at is ship function to the data instead of data to the function, uh, calculate and don't retrieve, so don't have tables, just have ways to actually uh, compute things. Um, maximize the utility of data streams. So once data is moving, uh, compress data, reshape workload, um, maximize uh, you know, the stream, the utility of the stream, of the flow of the data while it's on the move, um, and don't actually retrieve extra data. And so the key enabler is really the semantics of the data stream, as we will see. And uh, that's why I uh, advocate to coalesce data management with storage systems. Um, so uh, basically, that's how this would look like. Um, so in this overview, um, uh, in this talk, I, I will talk, I quickly give an introduction to a storage system and to scientific data management and then how to coalesce this to, and I describe our research approach of how, to do, how we're trying to do this, and a quick overview over four prototypes, SciAdoop, CIDR, SciShuffle, and data mods. Um, so, first of all, uh, storage systems. Um, this actually is interesting. There's no definition for storage systems. You go to Wikipedia, you can't really find a definition for storage systems, so I just made one up. Um, Systems for persistent storage and efficient access of digital data in form of byte streams or data chunks. Right, so storage systems is something that's underneath a database. It's something like a file system, but it's not a database itself, right? So that's how sort of I try to um, delineate the space. Um, the key challenge of storage system is to prevent data loss in spite of unreliable media uh, in spite of failure prone hardware, buggy software, and human operators. So storage systems are, as a software artifact, unique in the software field because they have to be extremely correct. And that's why you see actually very few examples today in the open source community um, of storage systems. They are coming, but that's a very new thing. Uh, so far, they've been always proprietary because they take a lot of work to actually uh, you know, work in a such a way that you don't lose data. If a system crashes, okay, you get annoyed. If you lose data, you get hysterical. Um, so the interfaces um, of storage systems are typically block-based, um, used by local file systems or data manage based management systems, uh, or you can have an object-based interface uh, that's typically used in parallel file systems and cloud stacks, um, or you can have like a, a file-based interface, which is what we can you know, know uh, uh, as file system. Those are byte streams. And incidentally, the interface of these file systems is typically POSIX IO, which is an interface that was created in the 1980s. And you had many, many orders of magnitude less data to handle than you have to do today. And so this interface standard POSIX IO becomes really inadequate in today's time. Anyway, so this is a very qu a quick overview of what uh, file systems are. Um, I will mostly talk about file systems, uh, so storage systems, file systems sort of take that, um, they're, they're similar. Um, so we have on top of the applications, applications that act with uh, the operating system uh, via the POSIX IO interface. Uh, the operating system runs the file system, the file system interacts with the logical block interface with disks, and they have sort of a block IO manager and so forth. Um, if you go further in the evolution, so that was a local file system. Here's a network file system like NFS. Um, you know, you actually split the file system component uh, so that yeah, you have file system clients and you have file system servers and you have a protocol called NFS to interact with these two. And this is typically one server with multiple clients. Um, then um, uh, today, in very big systems, uh, in, H in high performance computing as well as in the cloud, uh, you have parallel file systems. And the idea of parallel file systems is that you split the metadata stream from the data stream. Um, and you can sort of see the metadata server as sort of a traffic um, shaper of the very difficult metadata data stream. Uh, metadata is highly dependent on each other. 
It's very small uh, transactions. Um, it is notorious for hotspots. Uh, so you need to actually sort of deal with metadata in a very different uh, way than with bulk data. So that's why these parallel file systems kind of split this out. And I will quickly, uh, in, um, in the example of Ceph, Ceph is an, a parallel file system we built and that's actually now uh, commercialized and um, the student is, has founded two companies, Ceph.com and Inktank.com um, uh, that are you know, built around this uh, open source file system. Um, and so we published a paper in OSDI 2006. So the way this works is basically a client sends an open request to the MDS uh, metadata service, which is a distributed service. Uh, the client um, receives the capability uh, based on the open request receives the inode information and receives striping strategy. And this is really important, the striping strategy, because now the client knows how to map files to objects uh, based on the striping strategy. It can generate its object names locally, so no lookup tables, and it can calculate the location of these uh, objects using the crush function. Again, the crush function, that's a paper that we uh, published in supercomputing in 2006 also did also a sage while. So this is making the thing very scalable. Metadata becomes really small and constant size because there are no lookup tables. A very key ingredient of a lot of scalability uh, properties of, of Ceph and other parallel file system who've adopted this approach. Um, so that's so far uh, my storage systems um, spiel. Uh, the introduction of scientific data management. So data management is a way of, um, uh, it, you know, organizing data and organizing the processes of how to access data and uh, how to make data more valuable. Um, and uh, a database model, or also called data model, um, is sort of the foundation of how you organize the data and it becomes really important when you want to optimize. So for relational databases, the database model is relational algebra, and uh, the, uh, it is extremely important for the optimization of, that, uh, of, of a relational database to have that algebra, right? So this is all I want to say. There's much more you can say, of course, but this is sort of the, the important thing to remember when I talk about scientific data management, that I talk both about how to manage scientific data, but also what data models um, we're looking at. Um, so the uh, data models that you find in, uh, in, in scientific data uh, management today is uh, there's relational databases for catalog data, typically like this uh, Sloan um, uh, Deep Sky Survey. Um, the LSST, I forgot the, what the meaning of the acronym, but it's the, the observatory in, in, uh, in Chile that on the, in the big mountain that, um, that scans the sky every, every night and produces 15 terabytes of data every day. Um, the, uh, and so basically the catalog data are the features that have been extracted from the images. Uh, and the relational databases and the relational data model is really uh, a, good, uh, a good model for that. Then there's array-based database management systems um, that actually you know, chose to not use the relational data model, but actually an array, multidimensional arrays, because scientific data is mostly that. And examples are SciDB, MonetDB, and Rastaman. And there's actually a new effort at, the, um, at, the SLA at SLAC, uh, Stanford uh, Linear Accelerator, um, uh, with ArrayQL, uh, Jacek Beckler, and KT Tian, I think, um, is, uh, is heading that effort to standardize a, a query language similar to SQL to look at array, uh, uh, the array-based data model. Um, but typically what you see today um, is that um, you have middleware, which is sort of the application, and then there has a bunch of libraries and and, and you know, software that uh, the application uses to interact with the storage system implements uh, a whole bunch of array-based file formats. And so, um, so basically data is still stored using the POSIX IO interface uh, in byte streams 
um, and that's um, you know that that has a bunch of uh, consequences that we get into. But the reason for that, for having a very simple byte stream, is basically anything fits into byte stream, right? It's just bytes. Um, uh, the reason why that uh, has been so stable is because it's a vendor neutral interface. And so um, rather than worrying about the intricacy of having storage systems to work correctly, uh, one, you know, the, the kind of trend was to accept a very universal storage that you know was reliable and then worry about all the data management fun functionality outside of that storage system. So you could actually change the vendors um, uh, for proprietary storage systems. This is changing now. Uh, now these storage systems become open source. And so now it's that, that uh, mismatch between uh, you know, more area-based structured data and byte stream data is, um, is not as motivated anymore. Um, so what really, uh, this is basically describing what I just said. Uh, uh, the middleware is sort of between application and, and the POSIX I.O. interface. And um, what's really, uh, uh, what middleware often has to do is has to design for magic numbers. So these file systems, they have like certain alignments that work really well. So when your data writes are 4K aligned, uh, that means you know, every, every 4K bytes, um, uh, things work much better than if you have misaligned uh, writes and reads um, because you have lots of file sharing, especially in a distributed system. And so the, um, there's other magic numbers and it's hard to figure out and that change also from file system to file system. Um, and on the other side, the storage system underneath is absolutely clueless of what the data semantics are, right? It cannot make any optimizations about data that, that, um, uh, that gets stored on a parallel file system. It can only sort of optimize byte streams. Um, so which means basically, you know, figure out how to do random reads and writes or sequential reads and writes. So, um, Basic, uh, so, so what you find in a parallel file system are a number of very useful abstractions that are hidden under this POSIX I.O. interface. So byte streams are kind of dumbing down a lot of really cool things that a parallel file system does today. Uh, not only Ceph, but also other file systems, uh, parallel file systems that are, today, that are available today, but I'm just looking you know, at Ceph in particular right now. So for instance, you know, the, the whole client part of a Ceph file system, you know, has calculated placement, failure domain model, compact metadata. Um, you know, then the, there's the metadata service that has like a hierarchical namespace, dynamic subtree partitioning, capability management, and striping strategy. All these things are much more general services than uh, is needed actually for the POSIX IO, and they're very scalable. And then finally, you know, the Ceph Rados system which is actually more popular than the entire file system. It's actually now part of the, uh, a lot of the open source stack uh, plays like cloud stack and open cloud. Um, it has an extensible object model, model, right? These objects are only used to read and write bytes, but you can do anything, right? There's key values uh, stores embedded in these, uh, in this object store. So you can have very different, much more structured things going on but these are not exposed today, right? So really, uh, basically, why waste all those abstractions and services? And what we are actually proposing is to open up these services and then have uh, some way of implementing other data models. Um, okay, I'm here you now. Um, so the, how do we coalesce these two? Storage system and scientific data management. So I'm going to talk uh, quickly about our research approach uh, because it might not be immediately obvious what we're doing here. <laughs> so the idea is basically merge scalable data processing uh, that's done typically uh, with Hadoop and scalable file systems, which is done typically by Ceph um, in our world, right? Not everywhere, but um, so, but these are both open source um, uh, 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 systems and um, so the, the idea what we're trying to do with Hadoop is basically extend um, the existing scalable platform uh, processing platform uh, 
um, and uh, figure out what happens, uh, you know, what are the basic assumptions of Hadoop and how can we change them and how can we extend it so that we can better process scientific data and based on those assumptions of the structure of the data, what kind of optimizations become available. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that uh, we try to sort of figure out what are sort of the services and concepts that enable these optimizations. And finally, uh, uh, extend a parallel file system like I already uh, mentioned uh, and create a so framework for software defined storage <coughs> and what we mean here is not code injection so a lot of people think of like active storage you know that was a big trend in the in the 90s um, let's ship the function to the data instead of the data to the function and that means you know we just inject some arbitrary code in the storage system that's really hard to handle and it's not, you know, it has all kinds of security implication, performance management implications. What we are proposing is that we actually um, uh, make storage adaptable so we can program it to implement a particular data model. But the data model itself is very well defined and it's not arbitrary code. Okay, so these are the research prototype. Um, uh, we have Sciadoop, which we published about in uh, Supercomputing 2011. Um, basically, what we show there is that um, when you uh, process scientific data, um, and in our case, we use the NetCDF3 library, um, then you can do a number of optimizations in terms of data, of, uh, uh, of input partitioning, and in terms of uh, how to early combine results instead of having to ship them from the mapper to the reducer. So there's a, a reduction in data movement. Remember, this is what we actually were set out to do. Um, simply because we have more insight about the structure of the data. Then there is SciShuffle. Uh, SciShuffle, and I'm sorry about the names, um, but the um, SciShuffle is uh, something we just published at PDSW 2012, which is a workshop at uh, Supercomputing 2012. And it's essentially semantically aware compression. Um, you know, we, use, it, we know, use that both on the byte level as well as sort of on the key level. So we can, um, uh, we can actually create incredible uh, compression rates just by knowing about the structure of the data again. And um, CIDR is uh, a prototype that looks at the routing of uh, streams between mappers and reducers. It turns out that map uh, reduce and Hadoop has you know, very basic assumptions that all the keys are, and that all, every data item, each, each key value item is independent of each other, which is clearly not the case for big fields and big arrays and scientific data. Um, and, uh, and then data mods finally is uh, our attempt to um, create these more generalized concepts in a parallel file system. Um, and in particular, we have generalized file manifolds, type storage objects, and asynchronous services. All right. Um, so let's give me a, let me give you a very quick Hadoop background. I promise probably most people know uh, how Hadoop works, but I just will focus on the important things for this talk. Um, basically, a Hadoop process starts always at, with the data partitioning. You need to split the data into, uh, into, in ways that you can parallelize processing of the data. Um, that happens either automatically, uh, it happens typically on a byte level, and um, that means when you have structured data, these splits can be arbitrary and they can just split like data structures apart, right? So they're not aligned to, the, to your semantic meaning of the data typically. Um, once uh, you have split the data and then you schedule these map tasks on each node and there's a certain number of slots you can, you know, that can uh, hold map tasks. And these map tasks uh, are assigned you know, by the master. And then also there are reduced tasks. Um, they're also on various nodes. And what's interesting is there's basically each node um, processes a split uh, one at a time. So the first 
And, and I think that the first node, you know, the input split one goes to node one, it splits two to node, also to node one. And then basic on, on uh, how many reduce nodes there are, it creates these key blocks. And then one key block goes to node two and one key block goes to node three. And, no, and notice that, you know, there could be, the mappers and reducers can actually run on the same nodes, but they don't have to. Um, so, you know, this is just to point out that some nodes have two splits and some other nodes only one. Uh, the reduced tasks uh, copy their assigned data as the, as the map completes and basically generate an output file. Um, all map tasks have to finish uh, before they actually can do that. Right? So that's a really important thing, and I will get into that more. So Hadoop is great, but there's a mismatch between scientific libraries and Hadoop. Hadoop is operating on byte streams, files, and then uh, scientific libraries really are on logical data. Um, and so it facts input, sp uh, split, input split generation and data locality. And so what we have right now, you know, Hadoop is basically the input, is input split is on the physical level. So it, it operates on bytes. Um, then uh, the record reader is, uh, has sort of logical, um, you know, is, 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 so this is, um, sorry, this would, what would happen when you have used a normal Hadoop system with scientific data. And so the record reader would actually find uh, records upon, among multiple input splits and that could be on different nodes so you can have extra network traffic and so forth. Um, and then uh, you basically uh, uh, generate intermediate data uh, after, through your map function. You have intermittent output. There's, that intermittent output gets sent to the reducers, possibly over the network. It gets also stored on the local disk drive, stored on the remote disk drive, and then retrieved to actually do the reduce step. So all these processes I will get into more detail, but essentially for the SciAdoop version, we basically raised the input split to the logical level and um, got some uh, really nice results for that. Um, essentially, when you do the naive, you know, physical level split, you get uh, a locality of 9.3% or 3%, depending on the query. These are just samples. But if you actually uh, figure out how to, where the data is, and you group the data in such a way that you get mostly uh, um, uh, data that's, that's, uh, that has complete records, you get a locality of 80%. And for logical to physical, that's sort of um, an emulation of a file format. Uh, so you assume that the, the, the data is actually always aligned along um, structural um, boundaries and you get an even higher uh, locality. So, okay, so then one thing that we did inside in the SciAdoop paper, this actually turned out to be in our network not very much, um, it didn't have much impact on our runtime, but what did have a huge impact on runtime was this other thing where we tried where we looked at uh, holistic functions. So a median is an example of a holistic function. You cannot compute a median without having your complete input. Um, so, uh, what happens typically in a MapReduce program when you have a medium somewhere is that all the data that you cannot, you can only collect the data at the mapper level, but then you have to send it to the reducer and the, only the reducer can actually do the median, compute the median because you have to have all data together. Um, so this is an example of that. Um, so on the left side, uh, you, you see this case where the, the, the mapper had actually all data at the mapper level but because of this assumption that holistic functions need to be always shipped to the reduce level, all the data gets actually shipped to the reducer needlessly and, um, and, you know, and you have a lot of network traffic. On the right side, that's the more general case where you actually have to send the, uh, the data to the reducer to actually compute the median. Um, so with this optimization, we actually compute the holistic function at the combiner, which is attached to the mapper process. Um, and, and so the, this, state, this step doesn't actually have to go over the network, only this one, right? So 
uh, if the combiner knows it has all the data for this function available, and that's only really, it only knows that because of semantic understanding of the data, then you can actually do this uh, median computation there. Um, so there we have a very dramatic impact um, and in terms of um, data that gets shipped between mappers and reducers, it's dramatically lower. Um, and uh, for you know, CPU utilization, we have actually now, you know, we are actually, you could say, CPU limited, which is a good thing. Um, and uh, we have uh, also much faster runtime. So um, let's go to the next uh, prototype. Uh, that's Hadoop shuffle, uh, size shuffle should be. So uh, the current situation in Hadoop systems is uh, it, there are certain assumptions. So key values are always independent of each other, as I mentioned. Um, to keys are serialized, they're converted to bytes representation immediately when output from a mapper. And then, then the key value pairs are atomic. So a very wasteful way of handling uh, metadata. As you can see here, this is scientific data, and this is sort of a binary dump from data that gets commuted from mappers to reducers. Um, as you can see, there's um, a variable called wind speed one, and it gets repeated for every key, right? So if you have multiple variables that you transmit in a mapper, it's a huge amount of data. And in fact, if you, I don't know whether this works, this doesn't work. Um, if you uh, look at actually on some of the experiments where we had, uh, in this case, um, uh, 22, uh, 22 reducers, um, uh, 22 mappers, and 22 reducers, I think. Um, this is basically a, uh, a, frac a fraction, fraction of the total output available over the time from job start. And so you see basically as the mappers kind of progress and they, 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 you know, they complete the overall job, uh, you see uh, that if, if the, in, in one case, which um, has some optimization that I'll talk about in a moment, uh, you, know, you see basically the reducers kind of catching up and some other case, which is the more standard case, uh, you see uh, reducers sort of waiting until all the, the mappers have finished. And so there's like this time where you actually have to transmit all this data. And it's, it's a significant amount of time, uh, you know, um, that, that is just there because you have to transmit all these keys. Um, and so, uh, so basically that's, uh, so we, we looked at that and said, how can we compress that? And uh, it turns out that if you just use gzip, that works already, right? Um, but uh, let me just go back. Um, I want to, before, I, before I, I, I go on, I'd like to also come explain what exactly actually happens in this, in this shuffle. So basically the mapper, when the mapper uh, computes a result, that is stored on disk. Uh, then the combiner retrieves the stuff from disk and then combines the keys, you know, the, the values of the same key and then puts it back to the disk. And then, it needs to be retrieved from the disk again if, it, if the reducer is on a different node. So you have all these reads and writes on the disk for each item. And, you, and the same thing on the destination disk, a destination node, you know, you, you, you have to retrieve the data to sort it, store it back to the disk, and retrieve it to reduce it. That's, I mean, everything you do to this intermediate data that, that shortens that is uh, reducing a lot of data movement. So it's actually amazing to me that, that nobody has actually looked at that before. Um, but uh, so, the, uh, so what we found is, uh, let me just go back here. Um, you know, when you, when you just do gzip, you get our amazing compression, but you can actually uh, go much further than that. Um, if you actually transform the data, given the, the knowledge of semantic, you know, how the data is put together. So if you have arrays, you have uh, typically um, these, these coordinates, and you can sort of see, okay, you know, one, 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 two, one, three, one, four. Um, you can very quickly kind of figure out, 
okay, these are coordinates, you know, uh, it's actually hard for GZIP to pick this out. But it is actually uh, fairly easy for a human to write a program that uh, predicts this and then it creates deltas where you have essentially just a predictor and zeros. And zeros compress really well. Um, so that's what this transform um, does here. And we tried transform with gzip and transform with bzip too. And it actually uh, has uh, some amazing results. So this is basically the, uh, the situation today where most of the data that you transmit, uh, especially when it's scientific data, are keys. And only very little useful data, actually. right? And so this is all metadata. And this is a situation where most of the data you transmit is actually metadata and highly redundant. Um, so I'm just, uh, one thing that I'd like to um, also point out is that because we have scientific data, uh, we like to actually, you know, arrays are really easy to describe. They're very regular. And so you need actually very little information to describe them. So if you transmit an array um, in MapReduce, you know, you should be able to just have a header and then lots of data uh, instead of having a key for each, um, for each item. So we came up with a whole bunch of uh, uh, ways of doing that. I, won't, I will refer you to the paper um, that we also published in PDSW this year. Um, but essentially, uh, the uh, results that we get uh, are pretty dramatic. Uh, so the reduction of intermediate data is 60.7% for this 800 by 800 by 800 integers matrix. That's small, but it's only going to be bigger if you, know, if you have bigger data. So it's, it's, it's sort of an indicator that this is like a very low-hanging fruit to, um, for any kind of MapReduce processing. Um, uh, for, of big data, and especially when it's structured data. And the reduction of runtime is also pretty significant. So um, I want to sort of quickly me uh, mention the uh, synergy we have with another uh, prototype. And I'm not going to go into the, proto uh, the CIDR prototype today because of time. But um, the uh, uh, what CIDR does is essentially intelligent routing, and uh, there's a hash function in, in, in MapReduce that basically maps M uh, mappers to N reducers, and it's sort of like a round robin mapping. And the, um, so you have M times N connections uh, in, in that scenario. And so if you know something about the semantics of the data, you can actually reduce those, those connections dramatically you keep the logically uh, contiguous data together, and you can actually uh, compute much more efficiently, uh, especially in combination with, these, uh, with this compression. Um, and you can uh, make much more assumptions uh, between the mapper and reducers when you instantiate them. So you have a lot more information sharing, and you need to consequently transmit a, much, a lot less information. Um, the, uh, basically, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the idea is then also that, yeah, and also the other effect is that you, you get uh, earlier results. So because uh, the reducers can uh, begin, er reducers can begin earlier because their source is well defined, and they don't have to wait until all the mappers are, um, are um, completed, only the mappers that they depend on. Um, Okay, yeah, I will switch to a different slide set for the, how much time do you have left? About five minutes. Five minutes, okay. See. All right. Um, so, for data mods, really quickly, this is essentially the, the situation that you see both in scientific data format as well as sort of in the Hadoop ecosystem for big cloud computing. You have um, a lot of different abstractions, and you know this is sort of what I called earlier middleware. Um, uh, you have scientific uh, formats, NetCDF, HDF5, so forth. Uh, you have um, uh, MPIO, ADOS, PLFS, and all these things kind of translate, try to translate, um, uh, you know, the, the semantics of, of data 
into something that works well in the byte stream interface. And so, uh, on the other hand, we have highly scalable services that, that sh could be customizable, and so we try to sort of find good abstractions uh, between them. Um, and so, uh, so what this really comes down to is the interface of what we consider today a file. And we came up with the name of manifold, but you can use it, you know, some other name. But it's essentially a file that bounds, binds together a bunch of uh, data containers. And uh, the interface to that file right now is just read and write byte streams, right? But you can think of other interfaces. And so I will very quickly give an example for a particular simple example, um, but also a very important example of a sequence file. Um, that is very often used in, 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 in Hadoop. And so, um, a sequence file, and so watch on the left, on the right side, there is this interface that we kind of create as we go through this. But you, you see essentially how, um, uh, you know, information that's stored in a file and that a file system normally wouldn't know about uh, can actually have a nice interface that the file does know about. So basically, you, you, you create in every sequence file a header, and that becomes a hotspot because it needs to be updated every time you, know, you change something. Um, you then append records to the file, and um, so that basically creates sort of get metadata, append uh, key values, uh, and then um, you know, when you store them in a file system, you do blocks, and the blocks are not aligned to the actual key value pairs. So that uh, creates problems. And so, um, and then you basically, uh, you know, have like, so when you look at this interface on the right side, um, these are basically methods that we want to directly implement in a file system. So we have sequence files as a file type, and these are the methods, and then the file system can directly implement these uh, without having to do scans and all these operations. Um, so this is basically the abstraction. We have file manifold. Um, we have uh, active and typed objects um, that are, you know, fit well into a particular manifold definition. So we came up with this uh, whole concept of a data, mod data model module that uh, is a combination of well, very carefully designed object interfaces on the object storage level and uh, file interfaces on the uh, file system client level. Um, so, and then plus we have asynchronous services that actually every file system has already, and we want to expose those as well. Um, and we can actually embed indexing, compression, sorting, reorganization, all that stuff into these same services. Um, so, I think I'm almost out of time. Um, so, just as a uh, summary, file manifolds are, um, you know, are essentially concepts that uh, take care of the metadata and the data placement and an active and typed storage, uh, expose low-level services and are well-defined uh, for a programming model. So, thank you. And I'm sure there are many questions. Sir, thoughts on? It was a very, very technical talk. We got all the details, right? Yeah. There you go. Thanks. Hey, Carlos. So thanks for that talk. Very interesting. Um, I'm just floored by how complex some of these systems have to be to use them efficiently, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that it sounds like many of the implementations that are out there could be significantly optimized, and that's some of the work that you guys are doing. As a consumer of such systems, um, or, you know, part of your pitch was there's going to be a combination between data processing and storage. Um, I, I'd like it to be as simple as possible, right? right. Um, so, you know, some of these lessons learned that you guys have discovered, are they going to be working their way down into the 
you know, the storage system layers that are available in Luster and, you know, on the file systems I use, or is this going to need to be collaborations between your teams and the, the simulation codes that, that run on these machines? So that's an interesting question. I think we see sort of a new role. Um, you know, we have, if you look at scientific application programmers, they are actually, and visualization programmers, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, they, they try to, they like to use libraries, right? Libraries that do exactly what they want. And they like yes, to interact exactly. with, and, and they like to interact with, so somebody has to write those libraries, yeah. and you, you call that middleware, or, you know, and we, we advocate that actually there's going to be, there's going to be middleware programmers, and they're going to be uh, storage data model programmers. So they are going to be sort of a level lower. They don't program the file system itself, but they do actually program the data models. Um, and make them work well and you know, make sure that they optimize uh, well mm -hmm. um, for you. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's gonna be a new role, but I th you see that already happening with EDOS and PLFS. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a new crop of programmers who don't implement actually a file system, but they implement a intermediary, uh, right now it's called interposition layer for file systems, um, that works well for a particular workload. And I think that we just try to generalize that, that it don't, not only works for a particular workload, but also for a data model. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, you know, I totally agree. That's actually one of our core missions is to make things easier, but I think it takes more layers mm -hmm. um, than just, you know, we, I think storage systems are, they have gone a long way and they have fantastic services, but because of the history of POSIX IO, mm -hmm that has not been exposed to it. Uh, nobody has been exposed to these services outside of the POSIX interface. So. Okay, well, to be continued this afternoon, right? Yeah. <laughs> Any final questions? Okay, well, thank you again for giving us an interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you.